right, thanks for sticking it out, everyone. We're almost there. <laughs> now, part of the mythology of Silicon Valley is the committed founder driving their company to a blockbuster IPO. But actually, startups are far more likely, 16 times more likely to be acquired than they are to IPO. But even then, it's a slog. Because last year, only 1.5% of all startups were acquired. So in no way is it an easy journey. And I, I wanted to start with you, Kamakshi, because when you were selling your company, your first one, Drawbridge, to LinkedIn, you were telling me earlier that you had an extra wrinkle that you gave birth in the process. So I want to know, which was harder, giving birth or selling your company? Uh, as a parent now, I'd say that being a parent is much harder than being a founder. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was uh, truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience to go through two life-changing events at the same time. And I, just for kind of the benefit of the audience here, it was literally the same time. It was not a figurative set of on or about the same semester. It was literally at the same time. So kind of the emotional upheaval of being able to negotiate a term sheet and see it through while kind of the nurse in the delivery room is like, what is your job? What is so important about what you do <laughs> that you can't keep your phone aside? That was an interesting dynamic. I wouldn't give it up for it's a truly kind of a once in a lifetime experience, an amazing one to go through. But, you know, Naveen here has interesting stories as well for, uh, for a acquisition. It's an experience every founder does go through. I'll start off by saying that while aspirationally everyone kind of there's this proverbial frontier of IPOs, acquisitions statistically are more likely than, uh, than IPOs, arguably more successful in many scenarios than IPOs, and certainly something that founders have to kind of mentally, physically prepare for. It's an endurance journey. Yeah, so when you did that and you went through the process, was there any moment where you're like, oh, I wish we could have waited, I wish we could have kind of strung this out a little bit more? Did you feel like the outcome was satisfactory? Uh, outcome was very satisfactory given kind of the size of the size of the business, type of business, both the macro, micro kind of economics and dynamics that Drawbridge was spe specifically going through. Acquisition was very timely for us. But given that kind of, you know, we were in the business of data as a service and uh, it is uh, a regulated industry. So as a result of that, acquisition m and scenarios, especially LinkedIn as a company is, you know, does things exactly right. So there's a very excruciating heavy duty diligence process that you have to go through. So I, I'm I, sure all of us have our own kind of war stories from the diligence process that we go through. So that's kind of what I would, uh, kind of my call out would be, that's why I meant by kind of it's an endurance board. You have to be mentally ready for that. And as one of my board members remarked that there will be at least three times, there's the rule of, rule of thumb of three, three times in the process of you know, negotiations and journey, you will feel like this deal is going to fall through. <laughs> you get through the third time, it's going to happen. Yeah. Now, Naveen, when we were talking, you told me that you sold your first company, Nirvana Systems, way too early. Do you regret that? Uh, I mean, in some ways, yeah. Uh, you know, it's always, maybe it's a grass is greener kind of a thing, I guess. But, uh, you know, it was, in some ways, uh, a catalyst for hardware startups mm -hmm. because we were, the first, we were the first AI chip company. And, uh, you know, we kind of showed that, wait, there is actually interest for this kind of a thing. It was a pretty good exit at the time. Um, and... You know, it, 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 it basically allowed us to like think much bigger and understand what the market was going to look like. But at the same time, I think we underestimated our own, uh, you know, place where we were. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's also one of these things that uh, a lot of people don't really talk about in Silicon Valley. We always talk about, like you, talk, like you were discussing, like IPOs, like all the success and this and that. Like founders are people. I was a person. I, you know... I went back to grad school, I burned through a bunch of savings, I got divorced, I had two kids. Like, these are reality, yeah. right? And it's like, there's someone dangling this term sheet, it takes all that pain away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I gotta put my kids through college, just like everybody else. And, uh, and I think that's just what, what it, it came down to. And that was your first exit, right? It was my first exit, yeah. yeah I mean, I'd been so. in startups as an employee before that, but right. not as a founder. And so I can imagine that that term sheet was maybe especially appealing. What, like, how was that as a first-time founder and then yeah. exiting that way? Well, I'll say this. So I, I, I talk to a lot of founders as, a, and as, a, as an advisor. I'm a seed investor, and I think a seed investor is typically like you know, a, a de facto advisor. And people are always like, well, should I, should I think about you know, who would be my buyers and this and that? I, I never frame building a company that way. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I think 
Well, I guess I am saying it's right or wrong. <laughs> I personally believe that you should, be, you should build a company and, and try to make that into a real entity. Right. Um, and if something comes along the way, great. If you try to set yourself up to, 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 to sell the company, it'll always be bent that way. Like you're always for sale. Yeah. And it's, I, I think the outcome will never be as good. So um, it happened in both cases opportunistically. I had no desire to sell. Um, in this particular case, there was a very large cloud provider that everyone here probably knows well. Uh, who, who started the conversation. We were trying to work with them on a, a partnership. And then, you know, I was, I was working on a fund, fundraise at that time, and we had a couple of active term sheets. Mm. Term sheets. And I'm like, well, if somebody's talking about acquisition, I probably need to tell the lead term sheet holder, you know, about this. And they're like, well, we want to talk about that too. And that happened to be Intel. And so got into a little bit of a, you know, back and forth uh, with a few other players. And, you know, we ended up with a, a pretty good number, uh, like 400 million. So, um, you know, it looked great at that time. We can join forces with the biggest silicon company at the time. This was before Intel's woes yep. uh, and process node issues and all these kinds of things. And so we were like, okay, let's, let's go. Uh, but, you know, the reality is always quite a bit different. Yeah. 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 Now, Dharmesh, you've been on both sides of the equation as both a founder mm -hmm. and as an investor. Um, how do you know when the time is right to cash out? <laughs> You don't, like you said, you regret after the fact, right? Um, <laughs> look, I've been a founder twice. I think these guys are being incredibly humble. If I had the kind of exit that Naveen or Kamakshi did, uh, things would have been different. But uh, I generally think of, as an investor, I think of three things in my framework to know when it's a good time to keep going um, or sell. And I say that with you know, having sold a company yesterday and having said no to an acquisition last week. So this is as fresh as this week. But three things have to keep going for a company. You have to have a product that customers love and are using. You have to sell efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you need to have money in the bank, right? If the three of them are right in a good market, we generally keep going. And you know, I've been fortunate to be an investor in MongoDB and Cloudera, Databricks, uh, uh, Confluent, Gong, many others, where every time we had an acquisition offer, we looked at the framework and said, are these three things true? Let's keep going. But we acknowledge that there are humans running companies. So you tackle that by finding a moment to give secondary to the founder, refresh them, revitalize them, and keep going. And in almost all cases, the eventual outcome was a lot better than selling the company. On the flip side, if two of those three things are not working in your favor, your product is not being used by customers, you aren't selling it, you may have money in the bank, and you can keep trying, but ultimately you're just burning money yeah. without adding value, right? or your product's great, but you can't sell it and you can't raise money. In those cases, you should be much more open-minded. And the sooner you do it, the better off you are. It's much easier to sell a company when you raise 10, 20 million yeah. and can still make a win-win situation for the founders and the investors and get it done. It's difficult when you have to raise hundreds of millions, then find out that things aren't working, like a lot of unicorns are about to find out in the next couple of years. There's 600 of them. Yeah. Maybe 50 will go public. There's a few hundred of them that will have to come through the harsh reality that you can't go sell the company effectively if you have raised over 100, 200 million, mm -hmm. and you just burned a bunch of money. So the sooner you can do it when, things aren't, when two of those three things aren't working, the better off you are. Or you can take the inflection route. That's the, the new, <laughs> new exit path. It's a very creative path. Yeah. I, d I just want to take a minute to like, reemphasize this fact that like founders, like, it seems like this kind of abstract unicorn concept in on itself, this, it's a really important line if there's one takeaway. Founders are people. And yeah. I, I think the reality of kind of, you know, whether the situation, circumstance, the team, the founders, your responsibility is to your investors and your team. Uh, I couldn't. I'm so glad that this is being talked as a topic on a panel uh, as kind of a, like a real path and a real outcome for founders rather than kind of in the hallowed kind of inside secrets of investment bankers who kind of you know, strike deals. So I just yeah. wanted to call it out there that glad that all of you are attending and learning from kind of you know, some of the yeah. war stories here. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, at the end of the day, investors, they may tell you something, you hear about all these stories about like, oh, good companies are bought, not sold. We should just keep going and have infinite you know, per perseverance. The reality is most investors have a few hits that make 100x and they pay the fund. And the rest of it, whether you make a 1x or a 0.5x or a 2x, it kind of doesn't really matter. What we try to do is say, okay, if things aren't going to be a 50 or 100x, 
Let's find them a good home early in the cycle. Let's do right by employees. Often a big component of the acquisition is a retention package for all the employees. And inevitably, if you do that right, many of those employees come back, start a company, and you fund them the second and the third time. And the second and the third time, they have much better outcomes. Yeah, right, yeah. Actually, but they come to you because you took care of them the first time. And I would argue, too, that um, this is something to look for in an investor. I, I, again, people look at, there's a name brand, there's, you know, whatever, like, HR thing they have that can supposedly help you. Honestly, all that I find is not so useful. It's actually what yeah. you just described. They yeah. kind of have your back. Yep. My board at that time, it was before secondaries became popular at Nirvana, it was in 2016. Actually, one of the board members said, look, I want you to keep going. I'll support you if you want to sell. I understand. But I will personally write you a check for a million dollars just to take this off the table if you want to do yep. it. And so I'm like, okay, I never forgot that. He was the first person I called my second company, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, Dar Darmesh, you said an uh, interesting point. There are three things that you're looking at, and one of them, of course, is cash in the bank. Yeah. Um, at what point, and maybe you can also answer this, um, w at what point does money in the bank become an alarming number? Like when, you know, there's probably no fixed answer depending on your burn rate, but how many weeks, months should you start looking out before you get concerned? My, I mean, look, we do mostly series A's and B's in the B2B software space, so those are different dynamics than a consumer-style company. My guidance to a company is say you at least have enough money plus two to three quarters to raise the next round. So whatever we agree is a milestone at the next round and how long it takes you to get there, let's give ourselves an additional two or three quarters and let's raise money that way, right? And then you can get non-dilutive sources of capital like venture debt. Sure. Now, some CEOs like Ali is incredible at raising a ton of money. But the smart CEOs know to separate the ability to raise money from the desire to spend it, right? So just because you can raise more money than you need doesn't mean you have to burn it because that could become a strategic advantage. On the other hand, CEOs who confuse the two and burn money because they say, now I've raised money, mm. I need to hire salespeople because magically the revenues are just going to show up. And then four quarters later, they burn too much and they have too little to show. That's how we get in trouble. So it's not an alarming number. You at least want you know, six to eight quarters in the bank at all times to give yourself time to execute and raise the next round. Anything more than that, don't spend it unless you really have to. Yeah. I mean, now we all know there are rules of thumb and then there's reality. Is that kind of what you found? I mean, personally, I, I, I agree with you. Having actually too much money can be a problem. Um, unless you've got an experienced founder, like they'll typically like, I, I, I call it the oh shit rule. Am I allowed to say that? I hope I can say Yeah, that. of course. <laughs> um, the oh shit rule is basically as follows. Like you don't hire anything until your team is saying, oh shit, I can't do this. Right? Like they're basically like you, you, you bend and bend and bend until you're about to break. And then like, I'll, I'll give you some relief. <laughs> so if like, and that goes for you as a CEO, like in terms of sales, you're the first salesperson almost right. always. And that means like, there is no freaking way I can handle this anymore. Like, I can't do it. No. And that's when you hire somebody. And it happens for everything. It's happening for your engineering teams, research teams, whatever. It's like the thing has gotten, there's so much pull and demand that you have to then hire. And I think if you, if you maintain that discipline, you can actually raise any amount of money. And Ali is a very disciplined CEO. And yep. I think that's fine for us. We can have a you know, billion dollars in the bank and we spend it when we need it. But um, I think newer founders sometimes don't do that. They overspend. And so I actually don't think it's about how much you have, like in terms of time runway, but more like how you're spending that and how you're making it uh, move forward. Because I can, I can see an experienced CEO operating with six months of money and they're like, no, 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 I know, I know, how, I know what I'm doing. I know this is going to come and then I'll go raise money. Sometimes you can trust that. Yeah. But with that said, I would say that it's also, you know, every kind of, you know, success story has had its tumultuous paths. So also be mentally ready for the fact that you will, you might encounter a situation where you don't have the proverbial six to eight quarters, you would have the two to three. And there have been tremendous success stories that have been written about it. That's, so the point is kind of the mental preparation for what this entails. Absolutely, you've been, you're a repeat founder, you have seen the story played out, you're better equipped to handle this. Uh, you're first time founder, you're statistically more likely to be able to, the, the F equivalent of the oh shit moment, oh, fuck, like what happened here? Yeah. So it, 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 does, it does happen, that's the, 
the point that I, I, I don't give up on yourself. Is the point. I, I don't know. Is there a, is there a, like a, a, a written rule of law for all founders? No. Each founder writes their own story, and that's a fact of life as well. So I think kind of the mental preparation for the fact that there are going to be these kind of oh shit moments. Be ready for. Be ready. That. Yeah. Now. Kamakshi and Naveen, you're both in companies that have remained fiercely independent, but your companies got acquired. Did you feel like you threw in the towel? Um, I'll talk about my second company that I sold to Snowflake. Uh, absolutely not. It was arguably premature because we got sold within a year of the founding. It's actually probably precisely the opposite. The strategic synergies were so strong that it felt like it was one of those rare moments in time where kind of the very oft-quoted expression of one plus one greater than two, I, I had great conviction that we could bring that to bear. Uh, look, as a, as a startup, to some of the points that Dharmesh has mentioned, uh, you know, to be able to sell efficiently. So to have the power of the go-to-market machinery of a large enterprise that can accelerate your time to journey and scale and operational scale, that's nothing to kind of shy away from. You have to own that. And if you can see that right synergy, right the, strike the right equation with whoever the acquirer is, that's why it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's a situation-by-situation -situation so in my case, I absolutely did not feel like it was a moment that was very rare to come. Did you feel differently about your first company? Uh, no, but it was a longer journey. I, it was seven years before we exited the company. There were lots, many more kind of war stories, twists and turns. Uh, it was the right moment, uh, given kind of what I just mentioned a little while back. But this was much faster. Someone told me, wow, that was seven years. This is a year less than. I said, well, you live and you learn. Yeah. Naveen, did you feel like you threw in the towel at all? Uh, on the second one, definitely not. Uh, on the first one, we kind of mentioned this. Yeah. But, uh, both of mine were two and a half years, oddly enough. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, like within, I think within a month uh, in length of time. Uh, the, the Databricks acquisition was, was an interesting one. I, I actually really didn't want to go down the acquisition route. I, I had a strong bias against it at this point mm -hmm. because of my first experience. And uh, I actually very, very strongly turned down several very large companies who, who came knocking. It was odd because it all happened right around the same time. Uh, I think that it tends to happen when you're like doing a fundraise, and we were kind of in the middle of that. And so I think that you know information gets out, and you know corp dev teams hear about stuff with their ear to the ground. And uh, you know several companies basically said, "Yeah, we we'd love to think about acquiring you." I'm like, "I'm not interested." It was very easy for me to say no. With uh, Databricks, it was quite a bit different. That was maybe the only option I would entertain because there was one thing uh, kind of hitting at what Kamakshi is saying. Um, I recognize that building my channel is going to be hard. Enterprise sales is, is a slog. It's really hard. No matter how much money I raise, it's time. I need to, I need to build a team. I need to build like, a scalable process. Like, it's, it, I need hundreds of people to do what I wanted to do. Um, and so I said, well, uh, can I short circuit that? And actually, can I get in front of the market? So I looked at it more strategically. Like, can I leverage the, the team at, at, at Databricks to do this? And, and Ali agreed. And so, uh, that was one aspect. In fact, I was trying to strike up partnerships with Databricks beforehand and Snowflake, in fact. Yeah. Um, funny, funny anecdote, I'll, I'll go on a little tangent here. When we were talking to Databricks, we went down this whole path. Ali wanted to announce it at the Data and AI Summit, which is the big um, conference we have. It's basically the same week as Snowflake's big summit. I was, I was asked to speak on a panel at Snowflake, and I'm like kind of slow rolling it, because I'm like, <laughs> oh, I haven't got the thing signed yet. Should I do it or not? And I was like, at the last minute, I said, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of See, these are the kind of fun stories you have down the acquisition path that, you know, as a founder... should have done it and then announced acquisition. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I, can I, so I'll tell you the other side of it. You know, I have this buddy of mine. He always tells me, like, oh, man, I sold my NVIDIA stock too early. I wish I had kept it because this would have gone up, like, 5x. And that sounds like a lot of founders are like, oh, I wish I didn't sell the company because yeah. now it's making, like, a billion dollars at IBM. I'm like, but you did. And IBM then turned around and invested $500 million in sales and marketing to yeah. get it to a billion dollars. Exactly. So exactly. The fact that you, know, you threw in the towel as a retrospective moment, you forget the, the effort you have to make post the investment yeah. to get there. right? So, um, and that's why it's a win-win situation for both sides. So most of the founders who say, hey, I threw in the towel, I'm like, look, you got paid forward three to four times. It wasn't an acquire situation. And the acquirer then spent a ton of money and took the risk to get there, and you had good technology, which is why you got the benefit of it. Oh, by the way, you have some retention bonus, which is tied to the success of the company on their dime. So 
Most founders who tell you that, hey, I threw in the towel too early, they probably will still do the same thing the yeah. next time or the next time after because, you know, if they're getting paid enough yeah, in value uh, up front. Acquihire situations are different. Acquihire situations like I had a great product, I just couldn't raise enough money and wish if I had a second chance. That's a different story. Yeah. I, I think that counterfactual reasoning, so we call it the machine learning world, is, is very hard, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to get ahead of that with, with Databricks. And so, cultural fit. That was where, that was the last thing. It was like, I think this is going to work. Um, How did you know you had that cultural fit? I, I went to dinner with uh, my, my co-founders and, and Databricks co-founders. We, we literally just went to dinner. Um, just hung out a bunch? Yeah, like, I mean, I was basically like, Ali was kind of giving me some advice on stuff. We were talking about like, should I go after, you know, government contracts and this and that. We were just kind of talking for a little while. And then it's like, hey, why don't we just get together for dinner with all the co-founders? It was just like, it just sort of worked. It was like, hey, I, it's like I know these guys, you know, it's like they're kind of my people. And, you know, whether that's because of familiarity or whatever, I mean, they all have PhDs, academic backgrounds. My, myself and co-founders all have the similar kind of background. Uh, open source, heritage, all of these things are very similar. So I was like, I, I know there's going to be disagreements, but I'm pretty sure we can resolve them. Yeah. And so that's like, why the partnership-oriented route, I think, that... I don't know, not to make it too cutesy, but the BD to CD part, like, you know, there is a partnership and like, that's the best way to know the people involved on the other side, especially if you're looking for this dynamic of accelerated go-to-market motion, et cetera. You have to, there are ways in which when you partner, you can, without like proverbially embedding yourself with the buyer, you're able to understand kind of the people involved and truly get like one, two layers below kind of what is the proposed model in terms of its viability of success. Whether that's in the form of a kind of, you know, a dinner conversation that's more informally or when then you actually bring a product to market as a part of a partnership, you get to realize these things. These ones are likely to succeed because foreign body rejection is a real thing. So you do have to kind of evaluate that. So it's a great point. <coughs> that Naveen brings up. How did you go through? Did you do the similar sort of dinner process, get to know them, or was it something else? Uh, Snowflake is not that much into dinner, so <laughs> I didn't do the dinner route, but uh, Christian Kleinemann, who's the EVP of product at uh, Snowflake, spent a bunch of time with uh, him, his team on the product side, uh, spent a bunch of time with Degnan and his team on the go-to-market side. And the synergies that came in, not in a dinner forum, but in conference rooms and customer meetings and joint opportunities that we won, and how they were able to integrate kind of a company that was still on the outside, but kind of building on Snowflake. Uh, I got a good sense of how this would look like. To his point, it's not that it's all going to be like hunky-dory right. and you're proverbially in some yeah. sort of this, you know, la-la land of constant agreement. But you figure out that, can you disagree with, like, grace? Yeah. So once you made it to the inside, what was that transition like? Uh, were you depressed, even though you made the right decision? You felt like you made the right decision? Um, yeah, okay, I'll tell you on the first one. Uh, <laughs> the first one was, like, very, I, I, for some reason, more emotional. Maybe it's just the first time you go first through time, something. Yeah. Um, I remember actually very distinctly. I called a I called a company meeting for my for the startup. Uh, got everyone in a room, and you know I was just gonna like say, okay, this is what we're doing. I couldn't even say it. I just broke down in tears and started bawling. And I was like, holy shit, that just came out from nowhere. I had no idea this was gonna happen <laughs> to me, right? Um, and it was just like this uh, realization of like an end, yeah. an era kind of a thing, right? Uh, and there's a lot of personal ownership. Um, and I think you know the, the, Intel is a huge company. It's very different, but Databricks was like, I mean. I'm working with the founders, I'm with that group, and you know, we, we, we tried to do the best possible thing we could do to like, continue that business and start to like, uh, you know, do integrations over time. We didn't do everything perfectly, but we worked in lockstep together, we tried some things, some of it didn't work, some of it did work. When it did work, we kept going. So we're 16 months in, and we're just, we literally last week, and I think, I think this week, I think Friday, we do a private preview for the final integrated component then everything is integrated. And I think we can end of life the original uh, contracts and all that kind of stuff in a, in a quarter or two. So it takes a while yeah. to do this stuff. Yeah. Come actually, what was your experience like? I would say, I don't know, I like to quote my therapist. She says, I like it every time you sell your company because it's more billing time for me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's for real. I will acknowledge that. Look, I think there's a certain amount of kind of, you know, reset that you would have to go to where yeah. kind of the proverbial you call the shots 
to right. kind of you have to work within a construct, yes. right? There's a framework. That's, that's an adjustment. That's for real that founders have to go through. Um, I became better the second time around that I did this. I, I, I understood kind of the pitfalls and kind of my own personal shortcomings and my own personal kind of, you know, uh, plus points that I had. So I was able to kind of talk through that much more kind of productively the second time around mm. to be able to set up a scenario that proves to be equally, if not more successful. So Naveen talked about 16 months, different products, different companies, different scenarios. I'm not comparing, but we went GA in like four months since acquisition. So that was record time at Snowflake yeah. across any acquisition. So the ability to pull that off is not easy. The first four months is like the first trimester of pregnancy. It's <laughs> hard. Yeah. So, um, so I, I felt like I became better prepared to be able to set myself up, the team and the company for success. Uh, Dharmesh, being both on the inside and the outside, like what kind of advice do you give founders when they're going through that transition? Uh, in terms of integrating with the acquirer? Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's super important to have buy-in with the product and the go-to-market team. Like, again, depending upon the situation, if it's an yeah. acqui-hire situation, it's quite different. But let's call it a strategic acquisition where you're getting paid forward two, three years in advance mm -hmm. of what the potential is. The acquiring company, whether it's a late-stage public company or private company, is taking a hit on their near-term profitability and they're buying into the long-term vision with the sales team, right? So where I see things don't work is founders spend a lot of time with the product team and then the sales team inevitably rejects the new product which is riskier to sell. Mm -hmm. and so the more time you spend with the go-to-market team, socialize it, presumably you do that in the diligence process, right? So the acquirer will test the hypothesis with their sales team, see if customers have synergy in the process, and so I advise founders to spend time with the go-to-market team, talk to some customers, and make sure that there isn't a foreign body rejection by the sales team, because right. it's inevitably harder to sell. They don't know the people as much. So that's certainly one word of caution. Um, and the second, you end up in the situations where you know, technically heavy teams have an NIH culture, where the product team says all the right things because the CEO wants to buy the company, but then you, know, you can't win every battle. Like, you know, even though a startup presumably has the talent, that the large company didn't have, there are, you know, not every battle is worth fighting. Like there are some areas you kind of let go, others that are synergistic and important that you got to focus on. Um, and so, you know, I think those are some words of caution in terms of integrating with the team. Um, and third, you know, the, I try to make earnouts as much as possible for the, the team being acquired, tied to the joint success of the team. So, you know, if you just have a time-based vesting saying, hey, Two years, you keep getting paid a big chunk of your earn out. You know, they start checking out three months in and then you have you know, another 21 months before you want to leave. Um, but if there is an element of joint synergies, you get a separate budget to try the go to market route and there's a, a meaningful upside by, uh, by the joint targets that you set together, I think it just aligns people the right way. Um, those are things that we try. Mm -hmm. you know, usually you get two of those three right and those are generally decent acquisitions. Um, uh, but yeah, I just couldn't reemphasize what uh, Dhar Dharmesh said about spending time with the go-to-market team. So critical because that's a place where the foreign body rejection can ha manifest itself hardest, fastest. Uh, really, really critical and important. Uh, second, more tactical matter is you spend a lot of time pre-acquisition with the card dev team. Put your people on that. Spend time with the product and the go-to-market team because that's who your kind of family is. After these people are there and they're kind of months leading up to it, but have yeah. It. Well, it's, it's interesting because in like Databricks, it's it's very founder-led, um, and so yeah. neither of these things happen. Like mm. they're, the Corp Dev team is a blocking and tackling team. They're not in any way a decision-making team. It's the founders who make the decision. Yeah. The product and engineering are run by the founders. So I actually had none of this. There was zero foreign body rejection. Like it, I had the inverse, inverse experience at Intel, but at, 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 at Databricks it was like, no, 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 we're gonna make this work and it's coming tops down, yeah. that's it. Like there's no question, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I think that's why I thought yeah. things could work as well because, because there was a very strong founder culture. Uh, yeah, that's true. Now, Kamakshi, you said something interesting earlier about the shift in mindset, right? Where you're the shot caller yeah. as a founder and then it's very different once you're inside the company. Like, what was that, like, what sort of transition did you have to make inside yourself and then operationally to do that? 
Um, I'm going to have a moment of vulnerability here and say that there was first time I did this, uh, it was harder. It was harder for me to come to kind of terms in reality with it. But then, can you know, you, you, you have skills to learn in larger organizations as well. Like at LinkedIn and Microsoft, uh, sitting in Jeff Weiner, who was the CEO of LinkedIn at the time, is a legendary figure in the Valley. And then, of course, Satya's uh, meetings. You learn skills of a different order of magnitude. You exercise your muscle in a different way. And kind of, I learned to embrace it after kind of going through some moments of understanding how I adapt to it. Uh, and I think I came out richer, better as a leader and as a founder for that. Um, similarly, at uh, Snowflake, uh, Frank was the CEO of the company at the time when we sold it. There are I mean, some other legendary good market figures. I, lot to learn there. Uh, so I, I, I think having a sense of that humility, it's hard to come by sometimes. So, you know, as a founder, sometimes there is kind of, you have to be larger yeah. than kind of life in some way to be able to find a common purpose and mission. But I felt like that was a kind of a learning lesson for me, which I'd take with me for life. Yeah. Was it, I mean, you had very different acquisitions for yours. Were those transitions different for what you had to do yourself? Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot of lessons. I agree with that and, uh, inside of Intel. I mean, how you, how you scale an organization and all of that, like I was figuring it out as I went. Uh, at, at Databricks, it was less of that, but uh, I mean, the dynamics of Databricks are very different. Um, but it's more like, let's, let's I, I now have like another set of founders, which is different. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I am not, I'm not calling the shots. I'm not the CEO anymore. That, I would say, I always kind of joke, like, I think my job transitioned more than anybody else's, right? Because <laughs> I have a boss now. Um, and so that makes, it, that, that does create some difficulty sometimes. But you have to sort of get over it and work with, within this larger group. Yeah. And I want to remind everyone, we do have uh, microphones out here. So if you have questions, feel free to uh, line up. And looks like we have one already. I'll let you go ahead. Hi, Taran Tan. Um, I am coming more from, like, a hardware climate tech perspective, but I'm curious to find out how each of you think of exits. How do you plan for it going into the startup? Uh, the sage advice is always you know, plan from the exit and then work your way back and then try and execute. So the way I think of it is like, oh, you <laughs> spend the five years or whatever, right? And then if you somehow get an exit in between, then that's where you start to think, can I spend that delta of time building a company or can you uh, sell it and someone grow it even more? But how do you think of it? This is the one yeah. time back propagation will not work, which is you yeah. set your goal and then propagate backward doesn't Don't work. Do I, at least for me, that's my kind of, I hear like Naveen agreeing to it. It's like you go to, to, to Dharmesh's point, kind of the right product, sell efficiently, you have the capital to do so. You focus your time on that. And however trite it is, companies are bought, not sold, the right things happen at the right stage for the right strategic acquisition. Planning for it puts you in such twisted scenarios, both mentally, physically, and the decisions that you make that there's, I can barely think of any po positive outcome that comes out of those highly twisted scenarios. I don't know. I probably yeah. took a very yeah, strong stance. I, I just don't think you can do it. It's like saying, hey, I want to send my kid to college. Let me work back from that and see, you know, what clubs he should go join, like fifth grade. You can't do that. So you enjoy the journey because you genuinely are into it. And somewhere along the way, if a great opportunity comes up, you evaluate the pros and cons and you evaluate it. But you just can't. You can't plan an exit and work back from that. I don't build, think you can. Yeah, I mean, build something people want to use. Solves the problem. Yeah. Full stop. That's it. You do that, everything else will work. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We got one yeah. over here now. Awesome. Um, so I'm CJ. I'm building an AI car diagnostic co-pilot, and then that means that we are deal competing with a lot of dinosaurs who built this software 20 years ago. Uh, so my question is, like, when is it a timing for us to sell to them instead of competing with them? You know, obviously, they come with 20 years of uh, marketing channels and all these things. Uh, or, uh, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, like, how do you know when the time is right, depending on your market, of course? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 some of it's personal. Like, you just want a quick win and you want to get a, you know, a, a good position at one of these companies. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I would say the other part of it is like once you've kind of solved the problem that they can't solve. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of revenue yet or anything like that. But, you know, you look at a company like uh, WhatsApp, very famous acquisition, right? They kind of solved the problem that Facebook didn't. It wasn't that they had huge amounts of revenue, but they sold for a huge amount because there was very their high strategic value. So I'd say in these scenarios, generally when you have these big OEMs and there's a technology component, 
you're doing something they probably couldn't do because of internal structural things and stuff like that. And if you show that you did it, and then maybe you're starting to get some traction, or they see there's going to be traction, that might be a good, a good point. Awesome. Thank you. Great. So I think we'll go here and then uh, over to this side next. Hi, my name is Sina. I'm from Rico USA. Uh, this, mess, this question is for Kamakshi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, you mentioned that your therapist likes it when you go acquisition because of the bills more and all that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because a lot of founders like to, you know, that's a dream for them to go uh, acquisition. I, I meant more to the fact that, look, there's a personal adjustment to, that the founder has to go through from that, that, you know, probably you kind of being the, calling the shots, making the decision, carrying the responsibility as well for the success of the company, the team, your investors alike, to kind of figuring out the right dynamic of, you know, consensus building where applicable, taking kind of a new organization with you, to Dharmesh's point, getting kind of, you know, there is a new go-to-market organization that is taking your product to market. So there is kind of new relationships, new kind of uh, people, new culture. There is a newer culture element that you're kind of adjusting to as well. All of this comes in with a certain amount of kind of mental framework by which you, you have to adjust yourself. And uh, different individuals, to the point of personal, respond to it differently. And uh, I went through my own journey of responding to it in, in, I would say, second time around, I did a much better job of it than the first time around. Third time around, I'll probably do an even better job of it. So that's kind of what I'm talking about, the adjustment, and finding kind of the tools within your arsenal to be able to kind of, you know, handle yourself most productively, most efficiently, most effectively in these situations. Okay, thanks. You should get your psychiatrist number. Most of my CEOs come to me and they want to talk about what they're feeling. I'm like, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> One of my CEOs just approached me a couple of weeks ago. I got a number like, that. Yeah. yeah, no, it's like, you know, I think we have such a big exit that my wife now wants to leave me and go away. I'm like, I don't think I can help you with this. <laughs> <laughs> this is beyond my range of comprehension. <laughs> Over here. So there is this controversial term called brain rape where I've heard that bigger companies would try to understand the technology and the uh, competitive power of a smaller startup. So I don't know if that is something real, like as a new founder, I don't know if that is what happens uh, in the industry or it is just a tale. Wait, sorry, to clarify, you mean companies try to engage with you to, to get... Yeah, like you uh, had spun. been a right and then uh, you don't know if this is a conversation to actually acquire ah. or this is where they're <laughs> engaging with you to actually get your brain dump. It happens. Um, it happened actually to, to us at Nirvana, uh, my first company. Uh, a very large electric car maker, which you all probably know, did exactly that. And uh, I don't know, you got to be careful with this. You got to use your, kind of use my gut. And like some of my engineers came to me, like I left the meeting, came back and said like, they're asking these really detailed questions. And I went in there and I'm like, we're done. Get the fuck out. <laughs> you know, like kind of a thing. So um, that does happen, unfortunately. But you, you could be careful about telling them what you're doing, not necessarily how you're doing it, yeah. or divulging who your best engineers are so they can just poach them. I mean, there's ways for you to gauge interest yeah. without giving up your secret sauce. And good uh, buyers don't do those things, right? It's a reputation. Uh, right so, uh, and then you learn that from experience as well and rely on kind of your, your gut and your instinct. A founder's instinct is a strong one because it is getting really sharpened by the everyday experiences that you're going yeah. through. Rely on that. And as a female founder, trust your instinct. But it's real. It does happen. I think we have time for one more over here. Hi, I'm Akanksha, um, and I'm happy to hear all your thoughts, but I think Dharmesh might be the most suited to answer this question. Uh, since planning your exit strategy is so difficult, as an investor, how much weightage do you give to it um, like while evaluating startups? And uh, if at all, then what's the best stage? like? At what stage do you start giving? The so question it? is, how, how do we weigh the exit strategy before we invest? Exactly. That, yeah? Yeah, we don't, I mean, we usually invest a Kanksha at series A and B, which is eight to 10 years away from an exit. Um, all we are betting on is there's a large market with urgency in the customer needs, and we have a driven founder who isn't doing this to just make a quick buck. You know, they're resilient, they'll keep going. And so we plan to get to the next round and the next round after that on progressively higher valuations and better terms. We don't plan for the exit, but usually if it comes around along the way, when you're going from series A to B or B to C, 
that's where most of these strategic exits come in. I mean, I have companies that are two million in revenue and they get acquired for 400 million and you know, that was a good outcome for the founders in 10 months. And we're like, fine, that's, that's totally fair. Uh, the only time we start planning is if you are seven, eight years into a company cycle, there's a platform shift. Like generative AI is like changing the architecture for a number of companies that were built in the first generation of machine learning. And so if you've been around for seven, eight years, you haven't made the product pivot, you haven't made the shift, but now you have a, you know, 50 to $100 million business and burning money, that's when we say, listen, the outcome that you're looking for, an IPO, is not going to happen. Let's turn this profitable. Let's try to find a strategic outcome as opposed to raising a lot more money. So usually we think about exit planning once we're five, seven years in, and there's no clear IPO uh, exit uh, in the works. But at the Series A, Series B stage when we invest, that's not usually an evaluation topic. It might actually be a turnoff. If a founder comes up to me and says, hey, here's how we're planning an exit, I'm like, that's not, you know, you're not <coughs> big enough. Uh, so that's, that's our framework. I think that's great advice. Focus on building your company, and then if the right offer comes yeah. along, jump on it. Totally. Excellent. Well, we are just about out of time, so I want to thank Darmesh, Kamakshi, and Naveen, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.